Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, we're now starting the second session, and we will uh, go quickly over a few very basic checks that we think should be done in on every, basically every kind of data set you might ho get hold of or you might have. Those checks are extremely <coughs> reliant on what Tom defined before as self-consistency, -cons which means that often the only way you have to detect, the only ways you have to, to detect an error or something that is wrong or doesn't really fit are either by going record by record, which is something you can do easily if you have a bunch of records, <coughs> or if you, are, you have a reasonable large amount of records, say a few thousands, then probably we will need to rely on numbers, which means that you look for a pattern. You have an anticipation of what should the data set look, and then look for things that deviate, that deviate from that pattern. That normally means that strange records will stand out, as Tom Shaw showed us, showed us in the example with this person traveling faster, th faster than light. We might start by looking at how taxonomical records should look, and now mm -hmm. we find a problem. We don't know how taxonomical records should look. So we don't have a prior expectation here. We'll start with taxonomical checks. Then, uh, Lindsay, uh, will you go with uh, geographical checks, right? And, ah, you go, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you go with environmental checks. And then I'll go back to time checks. Okay. Um, What's a primary biodiversity data record? You all know what it is. Basically, it's the answer to a question, a quite simple question. A quite simple question. What is there? Where is there? Or where was it? And when was it seen, caught, or whatever? What, where, when? If, you can, if we can answer this three-dimensional problem, we get a PBR or a PBD, depending, primary biodiversity data record or or PBD for short. Now, since we are going to talk about taxon now, we'll concern ourselves with what? Uh, I didn't do anything. It's gone. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Well, Meanwhile, what, where, when are not the only three dimensions in a PIPBR. Those are the most basic dimensions, but there are more to it. Well, what else? Lots of things. Who got the record? Uh, Who is providing the data? Um, has, it been, has it been corrected, looked at, whatever? So there are a number of additional dimensions there. But the three we spoke about are uh, by far the most important. Things. Hmm. So, what's in a name? We're dealing with taxon names. A name is something that we need to anchor the concept. What we are concerned with are not exactly names, but taxonomical concepts. We know to explain the distribution of a certain plant or a, of, or a certain animal that we know by a name. And the name is just the entry point to the data. So we need to get the names right. If we don't, then what might happen is that we don't get the data associated to that name right. So the name provides for names provide for identification of the object of interest, which is the concept. Or at least what we can separate from another similar concept. We need to separate one plant from another plant and we use the names for that. Uh, ideally, this name should be an univocal identific identification. I mean, it should be associated with one single entity and should be resolvable. So the name should get us to the actual identity of, of the object, to the actual object, should be ideally fixed, 
it never is, <laughs> should be able to be checked and should be, if possible, tamper-proof. Almost nothing of this happens in, biodiver in the biodiversity realm. You all have passports, I do have my ID card, this is my ID card for Spain, and it has all the requirements. Yeah, that's me, I know. <laughs> right after scary. jail. <laughs> I'm putting my professor look. <laughs> so it has a unique ID, which is right here. This is my ID number, and it's unique. It's univocally tied to me and cannot be reused. And uh, so it serves all that and is apparently tamper-proof, in a sense, because it has a T here, which is a hash of the rest of the numbers. So if, some, if, if I type it wrong in some application or whatever, it won't match the T, so we know that something was wrong. Well, the problem is that we don't have that in, in, in the biodiversity realm. So this is me, Arturo Ariño, although my standard scientific name is Arturo H. Ariño, H is my second name, which is Hugo or Hughes. But there are also other Arturo Ariño around the world. This is a biker, I'm a biker, but not, I'm not in competition. This one, this guy, is, is, who is from my hometown, actually, is <laughs> in competition, but it's not me. And this is the most famous Arturo, Arturo Ariño, which is a, a graphical designer, which is Argentinian, and it's not me, and I'd like to be him, but I'm not. <laughs> so we, all of them, we are different. Uh, but we share the name. And we do have the same problem in biodiversity. There are shared names, which belong or which you refer to different concepts. So let's look at this. Let's look at this blue screen. <laughs> And now let's look at this animal here. And I'm going to use examples of animals because you know I know that most of you are botanists, so if I get it wrong, you won't notice. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> okay, how do you call this thing? Animal? How do you call it? In your in your native language. We, we all know that it's a jubarta. Or hump humpback whale. Hump humpback. Please? Humpback whale. Humpbacked or humpback. Well, it doesn't matter. <laughs> so how do you call this in your languages? <coughs> whale, the name for whale. <laughs> Anyb anybody? We're landlocked, so we don't have a name. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Cameroon is landlocked, Uganda is landlocked, and, but Kenya is not landlocked. Any Kenyan here? <laughs> Benin is not landlocked. <laughs> well, anyway, doesn't matter. This is a whale. Everybody knows it as a whale. Everybody, but, but Spaniards or French, which might call it Jubarta or Ballena Jorobada in my, in my name. But even in Spain, this, since there are many fishermen we, who used to think that th this was a fish, it doesn't tell much, much about the fisherman's ability, but they call it Ballena Jorobada, Ballena de Nudos, or Orqual Jorobado, or whatever. So it has a lot of names that all belong to the same concept. It's exactly the opposite problem as we had with Arturo Arino's name, that belongs to different, three different entities, or robots or whatever, but this, all those names belong to the same, to the same uh, animal, the same species. In fact, if you go to the OBIS, which is the, the world database of, for oceanographers, you will find there 84 vernacular names in 34 different languages, which is quite a lot. So who sold this? <coughs> we know who sold this. In theory, this was this man here. This man here, which which was, as you know, Carl Carl von Linné or Carlos Linneus or whatever you call him, a Swedish, who decided to put some kind of order in the names of the things, of the living things and in non-living things too. So he went on to prepare this monumental work, which in its very first editions was only like four pages where all the names of the animals and plants were there. <coughs> and he invented what we call the binomial system of genus and species. And by the time it went to, this went to the 10th edition, it was a large book with thousands of names in it. But the very first editions were quite, quite short. This is for the animals, and they could be either something with four legs, or two legs and two wings, or things that lived both in land and in the water, and fish, 
and insects and everything else was called vermes or worms, no matter what. Okay, so over, the, over time most of us have been using this linear system to classify and to put names into organisms to great success, to 1.8 million success to, to be precise and to, uh, to talk about the species that have received names. 1.8 million different species having names having been named by at least 10 million different names and that's our problem here. So let's go back to our whale. If we are scientists we don't call it a whale, we call it more properly a Megaptera novaingliae and we collect ancillary data such as we know that this is an adult female it was alive at the time of the picture, about to run my boat, and it was seen off North Uro, this is the location which is properly georeferenced, or as Tom will, you sh will show you later, is not properly georeferenced because it's lacking the uncertainty radius, but I can tell you it was something like from that table hmm, by the time I panicked, and then uh, <coughs> some additional data. But what is important here is that I called it, and I, when I recorded it, I recorded it as Megaptera Novengliae, and it went to our museum observation records, and it went directly to GBIF. So, GBIF records all the Megaptera Novengliae that somebody has seen, and taking the bother to, to report that. But it's not the only way to report the name of a humpback whale, as there are many vernacular names a long history, a humpback whale has been reported under very different names too. In fact, it has been called Balena Alamac and then after Gray did that, Hardis, uh, 50 years later, decided that it was a different species, Balena Atlanticus, that was eventually seen in mice by somebody else, and Balena Landi, and so forth, up to 46 different synonyms or 46 different names, scientific names that this animal had received over time, when it should have gone by one single name, whichever was valid. But then there is the zoological nomenclature code that, that takes care of cleaning up or fixing names or, or mudding them up even more, whatever. But the fact is that we have 46 different names for this animal. So how do we solve the problem that a name should be unique and we, we deal with taxonomical records, we need to know what is the diversity of a place, the richness, the number of species, and therefore if we have 46 possible names for a data set for the same record, we have a record inflation or a taxon name inflation which is 46 four. That's a problem. We have to reduce the spectrum. Obviously, we need to <coughs> use unique identifiers for the same concept. But we have to deal with this. This is what we'll have unless the data sets are ours and we have curated them and we have taken care not to make any mistake. Unless we do that, we have to deal with this. That's a fact of life, right? So, there are a number of solutions and one of them is going by hand, but there are more. A solution to the problem of the multiple names could be issuing a global unique identifier for each species in the world, or an LSID, a life science identifier. This has been proposed for years and it has never come to a satisfactory solution for everyone. This is one of the most contentious discussions that I've witnessed in that week, in GBIF, in whatever, you name it. Nobody can agree, it seems to be, it seems to be several different camps, not even two, several camps. Some, so, some people propose having human readable uh, uh, global identifiers, some others prefer strictly machine readable identifiers, whatever. Over time, taxon codes have been used often. <coughs> so you convert a name into a code. Or more recently, uh, identifying a species by genetic marker or species register or or putting everything in the species registers so a name is not used or in nomenclators or whatever. This is an example of 
taxon code. This, is, this was uh, set up in my laboratory 30 years ago when I started uh, doing these kind of things. And we decided to use a numerical code for each taxonomical level. So basically we could have, we could have any number of names that will resolve to the same taxonomical code. So by using the same taxonomical code, we could get the same kind of names. Uh, the problem is that we did that, and other laboratories did the same thing on their own, on their own uh, uh, conditions with different names. So names are not exchangeable, or codes are not exchangeable. I might have this nice thing with 40,000 species in my lab, but it all only serves ourselves and other labs which are using our system which is to say that it's not useful. This is GBIF's uh, system in which it assigns a unique identifier to each uh, occurrence of the species and a unique identi identifier to each name as well, which is very useful from a database point of view, but can go wrong as easily as anything else. Because there are so many things that can go wrong. As Tom said before, Everything that can go wrong will go wrong. There is no possibility of something that can go wrong not going wrong at some time or other. So there can be legitimate name changes. A species can be renamed because there was some problem with the original name or has been discovered that it was a synonym of another species or it coincides in a name with somebody else who published it elsewhere, which is a homonym or it can be a new combination, or the Latinization of the name can be wrong, or <coughs> we might have erroneous strings because of misspellings from OCR, from transcription, from copy editing, from whatever, you name it. There are so many things that can go wrong. And you might have even invisible errors. For instance, you can type the name of the species with an extra space at the end, and you will never notice it. For instance, just one simple sample. This is an OCR of, a, of an actual species list, and when you do the OCR from, from, uh, from a page which collected the original one, so this is uh, apparently clear, but if you try to, uh, to do an OCR, you get this, and everything in red is actually wrong, has been, got, has been gotten wrong. So basically, we're back to a few right renderings, and more than half are wrong. This is very typical from OCR when trying to get information from all sources. So there are so many trouble opportunities. You can misread labels, you can misread ledgers, you can misread cards, whatever. Even you can misread computer-generated uh, uh, printouts. What else can go wrong? Misidentifications. You might identify something as belonging to the wrong species or the wrong whatever. So this is our uh, Megaptera novengliae, but somebody in the field might have confused a uh, frank whale or a sperm whale or a blue whale or whatever with this and record the name as a juvarta, as a Megaptera novengliae. So many things can go to the same name and they are wrong. It's not that the name is wrong, it's that what is behind the name the actual animal, the actual concept is wrong. And then you have to add all that we saw to the misidentifications. We had to add the synonyms and we had to add the misspellings. And these things multiply each other. So the possible spectrum of problems increases almost exponentially. So from one single concept, you, have, you might have so many different actual meanings to the name. In our example, Megaptera Nova Inglés, if we go to, to GBIF's data, and we can, we can find there 25,771 uh, records of this species across the world. They are quite a lot. And most of them will go by this name, Megaptera nova Angliae. And everything else are alternate ways to name this species in GBIF alone. In Obis, there are many more, as, you, as we saw. The funny thing is that this is not the proper name. Which of you could point to the proper name of this species? It's not in the numbers. The main one is not really the right one, although it passes as the right one. But the right one is actually this. This is the Basionym, which is the name which is completely 
and properly uh, typed as it should according to the zoological code of nomenclature. It has the author and it's, in, it's parenthetically put because uh, it wasn't the name under which Borowski actually described the species. So basically everything is wrong. Although for functional reasons we might say that this name here without the author, which is something I'm ashamed to say before botanists, but I am ashamed to say that we zoologists tend to go away or to do away with, with, uh, with names, with the name of the authors. I know it's wrong, we zoologists know it's wrong, but we do nonetheless, unfortunately, sorry. <laughs> and what kind of errors we see here? This is a synonym, this is a synonym, but also it has a wrong Latin role, you can't use, you couldn't use for a time uh, diacriticals. Uh, this, has, this includes a modificator, it has to be confirmed, these two, these are synonyms, and this combines synonyms plus modificator. And this is a misspelling here with B, and these are incomplete. And this is a wrong rendering of Latin too. This doesn't conform to rules. Uh, this is another misspelling, and so forth. So there are several types of possible errors that you can get. In fact, if you look at the variants, the number of records is like this, so the most problem that we have here is the rules of the utilization of the name, and the cases are much lower, but still, it's quite significant. Over time, the types of errors change too. This is, the, the most records uh, which are wrong, are wrong because of uh, wrong Latin, Latinization, it, and they happen actually very recently. Somebody has put some, dirty data in the, data in the database recently. 